Hello everyone, my name is Greg Poole from the Swinburne node of ADAX, the Astronomy Data and Computing Services Group. And this is a tutorial on high performance computing with the G-Star cluster at Swinburne University. In this first part of the tutorial, we will provide a basic introduction to the practices of working with high performance computing clusters. This part of the tutorial will consist of an introduction to parallel computing, a discussion of how computing clusters are configured, specifically, how the nodes of a computer and storage are organized, an introduction to queue systems through which essentially all computation on a computing cluster is managed, and finally, how to operate a computing cluster, namely the writing of shell scripts, working with queues, and logging in with SSH. Modern computing clusters are designed explicitly to maximize the advantages of parallel computing. Parallel computing is a paradigm in which tasks are broken down into independent or semi-independent operations for simultaneous execution. This allows for vast increases in the computing resources that can be applied to a single task, providing for larger projects and or faster execution. As an analogy, we have here an image of a Formula One pit crew. This team needs to perform several jobs, refueling, changing four tires, conducting repairs, etc. And they must do these as fast as possible. While one individual could do all these tasks sequentially, each is independent of the others. Refueling has nothing to do with changing tires, for example. The team takes advantage of this fact by utilizing a large group of independent, specialized workers, operating at the same time to complete the task much quicker. This is the sort of work and performance optimization that parallel computing seeks to achieve. For another analogy, consider a large computational project consisting conceptually of a series of n tasks needing to be completed by a processor. This could be a payroll application, for instance. Several calculations need to be performed for each employee in series. For example, calculation of hours worked, hourly rate, taxes, printing of checks, and these need to be performed for each employee. Since the calculations for one employee are independent of those for another, this problem lends itself well to parallelism. This calculation can be broken down into a series of separate problems, one for each employee. Each is sent to a separate processor and executed simultaneously, providing a substantial speed up. Shown here is the G-Star computing cluster at Swinburne University. On the left, we see the computer consists of a series of cabinets. On the right, we see how these cabinets consist of a series of racks. These racks house a large and scalable collection of nodes, which we can think of conceptually as a series of independent computers networked together. The nodes of a computing cluster are individually specialized as follows. The head node. This is the node into which users must log in to access the resources of the computer. Compute nodes. These provide the vast majority of the system's computing power. They cannot be accessed directly by the users. Instead, computing jobs must be created on the queue managed by the head node. We will discuss how this is done later in this tutorial. Interactive nodes. Some computing clusters, but not all, provide a small number of interactive nodes. These can be logged in directly and used like a typical remotely accessed computer. These nodes are shared by the whole community of the cluster, and as such, are intended only for small, short tasks, such as text editing, code manipulation, small test runs, etc. Alternatively, especially if the cluster does not have any interactive nodes or if larger interactive tasks must be conducted, interactive jobs can be created on the compute nodes through the queue. Storage is also often subdivided into specialized units. Usually, users are given small but enduring storage in their home directory. This is intended for configuration files, source code, etc., and should not be used for large data sets that often form the input or output of computational projects. Instead, project storage is often allocated for this purpose. Such storage often needs to be applied for or won through merit allocation schemes. It is here that large input or output data sets should be stored. Lastly, large project datasets are generally not backed up. Furthermore, 
Many compute clusters have finite data longevity policies, whereby project storage spaces are cleared on certain dates or after certain periods of inactivity. For this reason, it is critical that users ensure they thoroughly understand the storage policies of the computing clusters they use. One of the challenges of operating a computing cluster is ensuring its efficient use and equitable access by a large number of users with diverse needs. Shown here as examples are four sample use cases. It is the job of the cluster's queue system to manage this task. Often the queue system manages several separate queues for managing different hardware configurations or for optimal deployment of different use cases. This is demonstrated here where three separate queues have been established for cases where jobs need no GPUs, one GPU per node, or four GPUs per node. It is the responsibility of the user to specify the correct queue when they send tasks to the queue system. Jobs are submitted to the system using a submission script. These scripts, which we describe in additional detail in later sections of this tutorial, specify not only the commands to be run by the compute nodes, but the resources needed as well. The queue system turns this script into a job and assigns it a job ID to identify it. User-specified resources can include, but are not limited to, the queue to be used, the number of compute nodes needed for the job, the number of processors to be used per node, the amount of random access memory needed, the amount of time or wall clock needed to complete the job, etc. Once jobs are created by the queue system, they may wait for some time before starting, depending on the resources requested and the degree to which the cluster is being used. It is the job of the queue scheduler to monitor the usage patterns of the cluster and determine the optimal strategy for starting jobs on the computer. In doing so, it seeks to maximize the use of the computer and maintain equitable access to users with highly varied needs. Having discussed how computing clusters are organized and how queues are employed to manage their resources, we focus now on a short discussion of how computing clusters are operated. Operation of computing clusters can be coarsely thought to proceed through two methods. Interactive operation within a traditional Unix command line environment, or shell scripts, which package sequences of commands allowing for optional variable arguments. These facilitate automated repetitions or non-interactive offline execution of longer tasks. The following must be done to create a shell script. A text file containing the sequence of commands to be run must be created. This can be done with the common text editor Emacs, for instance. The system must then be told that this text file is to be considered an executable entity. This is achieved by setting its permissions appropriately. Every file in the system has read, write, and executable permissions. These are set separately for use by the user owner, its group owner, and others. Alternatively, the commands of the script can be executed sequentially by the user shell by sourcing it. Let's demonstrate this process. First, by echoing the environment variable shell, we can see that our default shell is bash, and that it is located in the slash bin directory. Next, let's create a text file called hello.sh with the Emacs text editor. The first line of a shell script must be the so-called shebang line, which tells the system which shell interpreter to use when running the script. Next, we add a comment to explain what the code is doing. Then, we use the echo command to write some output to the terminal. Saving the file and exiting, we then find that the file exists in the directory. Using cat, we see that the contents of the file correspond with what we entered with Emacs. Using the ls command with the minus l option, we get some detailed information about this file, including its permissions, user ownership, group ownership, size, creation date, and name. Breaking down the permissions, the starting dash indicates that this item is a file rather than a directory. This dash would be a D otherwise. 
The next three characters specify whether read, write, or execute permissions are set for the user owner. The three characters after that specify whether read, write, or execute permissions are set for the group owner. Finally, the last three characters specify whether read, write, or execute permissions are set for everyone else. For this file, we see that read and write permissions are set for the user owner, while only read permissions are set for group owners and for everyone else. To use this file as a shell script, we must enable executable permissions for it. To do so, we use the chmod command as follows. Note that the u plus x here indicates that we want to turn on executable permissions for the user only. Using ls minus l again, we see that the desired permissions have been set. Running this script now, we see that the desired output is generated. The difference between executing and sourcing a script is a result of forking. When a shell is executed, a new shell is created, or forked and the script is run entirely within the new shell. Once complete, the fork shell is destroyed and execution returns to the original shell. As a result, execution occurs in a clean and newly initialized environment. When a script is sourced, it is run within the current shell with its current environment. To demonstrate, we return to our hello.sh example. First, let's define an environment variable, myvar, and set it to g2 space user. We then edit our script, adding this variable to the output it generates. Saving and executing, we see that my var was not successfully added to the output. This is because when we execute hello.sh, it is run in a new forked shell where my var is not defined. If we source the script, the intended output is created. This is because the script is executed in the current shell when we source it. To confirm this, we edit the script once again and change my var to another variable that is always defined, like shell. Executing this, we see that the variable has indeed been added to the output. Sourcing it, we again get the intended result. Shell scripts can also receive a variable number of parameters when they are executed. Within the script, these parameters are referenced using the dollar sign followed by a number. The name of the script when executed is assigned to dollar sign zero while all subsequent arguments are assigned to dollar sign $1 through dollar sign $n, where $n is the number of parameters passed at execution. To demonstrate, we create a new script called params.sh. Once again, we start our script with a shebang and a comment. We then echo the command name denoted by dollar sign zero. And the three passed arguments denoted dollar sign one, dollar sign two, and dollar sign three. We change the permissions of the file to add execute permissions for the user owner and then execute it, passing arguments p1, p2, and p3. The desired output is created. Having described how shell scripts are created and executed, we are in a position now to discuss the creation of submission scripts. Submission scripts are essentially shell scripts with additional specialized directives to the queue system. These directives can specify resource requirements, job names, etc. Execution privileges do not need to be set, however. These scripts are sent to the queue to be turned into jobs using a specialized submission command. There are two popular queue management systems, 
the Portable Batch System, or PBS, and Slurm. In the case of PBS, the submission command is qsub, followed by the name of the submission script. In the case of Slurm, the submission command is sbatch, followed by the name of the submission script. Lastly, because there is no way of knowing where or when the job will execute, it is not practical to monitor the output of the job with the shell we submitted it in. For this reason, the standard output produced by the job is sent to a file. By default, for a job with a given name and ID, this file will be named name.o followed by the job ID. PBS and Slurm work very similarly as far as the user's experience is concerned. This table lists, for each system, the commands which submit, delete, and pull the status of jobs on the cluster. Let's see how this is done with PBS. Taking a simple existing script, we shall first add our PBS directives specifying the job name, which we call test job in this case, the number of nodes and processors needed, one for each in this case, the amount of random access memory required, one megabyte here, and the maximum runtime or wall clock required for the job, which we set to one minute in this case. To extend the time required to complete the job, let us also add a sleep statement directing the script to pause for 30 seconds. We now submit the script to the queue using QSUP. Examining the queue with QSTAT, we see that, because of the small size of the job, it is already running. Sometime later, we examine the queue again with QSTAT and find that the script is no longer on the queue, indicating that it is complete. Examining the directory, we see that the output files have been created and that our hello world output has been produced. Finally, a few words about logging into a computing cluster. For purposes of security and stability, computing clusters can only be accessed through so-called head nodes, as depicted here. This must be achieved using the Secure Shell Protocol, or SSH. Implementations of SSH are available on every computing platform. Listed here are three easily accessible options for Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Note that external access to the compute nodes is not possible. All access to the system must be conducted through the head node.